scoot that out of the way. Minimize Hello and it. welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn, and uh, the date is uh, June 4th, 2015, Thursday. It's the day after um, uh, Rock Waterman's excommunication. So we're here to bring Rock back and to talk about the events of uh, June 3rd. And with Rock is his wife, Connie, and um, they have a configuration such that uh, they're speaking through a headset. So whoever wears the headset is going to be talking. So Rock's going to be talking for most of the interview, but there'll be points, at least one point, if not a couple, where he's going to pass the headset to Connie. So those of you who are watching on YouTube visually, you'll see Rock and Connie and um, and they'll take turns talking as it makes sense. But but Rock and Connie, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you, John. Glad to be back, as always. All right. So let's just start from the beginning. Take take us through what happened yesterday. Well, we uh, it was interesting because uh, I got a letter from the uh, state president a couple days after I got the summons. It was a letter about how we are not going to be allowed to record uh, and uh, that anybody... In the uh, in the room, any witnesses, including myself, would not be allowed to record and have to sign a document promising not to. And if we wouldn't sign the document, then we couldn't get in. So, and including me, so I couldn't go to my own hearing. It was interesting that that uh, that letter itself reminded me that I didn't have to come, but I was invited to come if I wanted to. I, we th- thought it was kind of amusing from the beginning. They gave me an eight days notice, and then. Uh, it was an invitation. Yeah, you can you can come if you want. It's not important. Clear from the get go that it was a predetermined outcome. Uh, Stake president Douglas Hansen, very very insidious. Uh, this was uh, it's interesting because we were wondering what the charges would be, and uh, it, it's interesting that he didn't take the tack that your blog is driving people out of the church, which was his previous assumption, the pre- what he had uh, claimed previously. But clearly he's enough online, or someone has provided him enough online, uh, of people responding to how much the blog has helped them stay in the church. So the tactic that he took was that my blog is persuading people not to go to the temple, which... Okay. Okay, real yes. quick, before we jump into that. So okay. talk us through, Did you did, um, when you walked into the building, w- was there anybody there to support you? Uh, oh, yeah. I, should, I was astonished. There were uh, more than a dozen people uh, just coming out of the woodwork. I didn't know there was really any around here. And there were some people who traveled a ways and uh, a couple of people who just had to be in the area. And thought, oh, good, you know, we'll we'll go and support him. So had a lot of love and support. And while I'm on the topic of love and support, my gosh, uh, Facebook is just, we're overwhelmed with the love and support of all these people, many, many, many of whom we've never heard from before. And uh, it's, it's just very helpful. And previously, we had a lot of prayers offered up. And I got to tell you, those prayers made a big difference in the room I, they didn't make a big difference in the outcome but my ability to uh to articulate my position and uh and and uh, speak by the spirit was clearly enhanced because of all the love and energy and prayers that were provided did did people uh take you up on your offer to to email you to to send notes to the stake president? Yes, yes, tons of them. I had so many of those that I didn't even have. uh, What I did was I printed each one, each statement on a separate piece of paper, and I spent most of the previous day doing that until I had more than 90 of them and ran out of ink in my printer and ran out of time anyway, but I could have provided hundreds, and I took those with the intention of reading them aloud, and as I'll I'll tell you later, there wasn't time to read very many, but each one of them, essentially, uh, we had people who said, thanks to your blog, my wife and I are, are, you know, are active in the church, married in the temple, full-time pairs, uh, just... Tons of things like that. We got one from a, a young man who said he was an atheist and he joined the church, and it's because of reading my blog. So, so the entire uh, the entire uh, tactic that that we expected from them, and it, partially that's what they did. Uh, that my my blog was detrimental 
to people and driving people out, leading them out of the church, completely overcome by that. And I left the stack of, uh, and it was a stack uh, a good half an inch high of uh, testimonials. I left that with them. Oh, of course, I'm sure they didn't read it, but I, I read it as I had time for. Okay. So how did it feel to have people there as you're walking into the building? It was wonderful because I wasn't really expecting it. And uh, uh, you got to remember, this isn't a watershed moment for me because I recognize that it's meaningless. They don't have the authority to cut me off from God, as they believe they do. They don't have the authority to separate me from my wife in the eternities. They don't have the authority to blot my name. It's just incredible arrogance to imagine that God is up in heaven saying, Oh my gosh, Douglas Hansen has directed me to blot out the name of Rock Waterman, so I, I've got to get to that. It's it's a meaningless procedure, but the, the reason I... I showed up and followed through was it I felt it important to state the position of all of these people tens of thousands of people who are having trouble with the church who are learning to reconcile remain LDS whether or not the church appreciates them or not and the important thing is the leadership of the church today is irrelevant I'm convinced that the Lord has withdrawn his spirit from that body uh okay so how was it how was it so you walk in the building what was next talk us through uh, well, sequentially building, what, what happened there was a woman who greeted us and uh and a couple of uh, two older men and a younger gentleman and uh she said are you rocks very very pleasant woman we learned later that she was a uh, low public relations for the church and uh and so was apparently one of the other men. And uh, they were in the foyer to essentially keep everybody else out. Everybody had to wait outside, uh, except for those who had offered to uh, testify on my behalf. And, and a couple of couple of people get that opportunity because I, I guess they <clears throat> weren't, um, weren't properly asked. But we had some good witnesses, and uh, it was just some powerful stuff. And yet we were before a body that was spiritually dead. Okay, it was wait, a lot wait. of go in order, okay. go in order. Okay, so all right, <laughs> okay, all right. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Yeah. So Connie and I uh, said I'd like my wife to be there with me, and fine. So we go into the building, and there's all these men, and uh, they stood when I came in, and I had Connie in her wheelchair, and we parked up to the top, and I, I was pleasant, and they showed me the seat, and I said, so this is the hot seat, and so. Uh, <clears throat> um, so there's now 15, right? There's 12. And then three, right? Yeah, I'm told there were 17 men. I, I bothered to count them, but there were extra men. And someone said they were uh, like three or four bishops who were interested in seeing. My own bishop wasn't there. At least I didn't notice him. Okay. Okay. So 17 people. My former home teacher was in there. I guess may, maybe he's now a member of the high council. Okay. I don't know. All right. So more than tw more than 15. What else? Yeah. Um. So the stake president in, in most quiet and officious way uh, you know gentle it was interesting because it's just like uh, uh, Paul Toscano and Margaret Toscano described the so-called uh, court of love as as you know uh, as being raped by the care bears because you know that they don't like you you know that they're uh, they're there to uh, in their minds strip you of everything of value in your lives but president hansen he 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 laid out the way it was going to go he said i'll talk for 15 minutes i'll lay out the the uh the complaint and uh and there will be no give and take, no questions answered during that time. So I sat quietly. I, I, I listened. And what the, the strategy was that Rock Waterman is teaching people that they don't need to go to the temple. And I looked, looked, looked at Glass at Connie, and I thought, well, where is that ever in my blog? So he went through a stack of papers he had, and he said he had much more, but he didn't have time. Uh, but what he, he, he said the procedure then would be I would be given a 45 minutes to respond, and that would include the time of my witnesses. So I didn't really have much time. By the time I got through with my witnesses, I had 15 minutes. Okay, and, wait. T so okay. so had, talk, through, again. talk through his actual case. G okay, give us a little case. more detail. His case 
this was essentially he took three of my blogs. Now you got to remember these four. The, these other men in the room were not familiar with me. Most of them had not read read uh, any of the blog. So they're getting this cold, and they're getting this idea that this guy that, that is before them now is uh, teaching people how to avoid going to the temple, which, of course, if you read my blog, there's nothing like there. But he started with the title of my piece, Go Ahead at the Temple Wedding. Now, John, Wait, as you go know, ahead. It's, uh, you, it, you're, you cut out. Say it again. It's called, it's called Go Ahead and Skip That Temple Wedding. Okay, right. Yeah, now I, I deliberately title my pieces to be provocative, but if you read into the piece, you realize I'm not telling people to skip the temple. I'm saying skip the wedding, and I explained in there. Now, once again, I'm, I'm telling you what, what the piece says, but the, bishop, uh, the president did not. He... he he quoted a, a, a few lines to give the impression that I was telling people to go to, don't go to the temple. Because what I said directly in that piece is that the, the only doctrine on weddings that, that this church has was given in, in DNC 101, uh, which was removed in uh, 1871 because it was an embarrassment. But the doctrine from Joseph Smith was that all men or all weddings in this church are to take place in a public place. And I went on to explain that, by all means, get sealed in the temple, but your wedding should be a public place, as Joseph Smith taught, and then you take that wedding and you get it sealed for time and all eternity. Well, of course, the bishop left that, that part out. Okay, okay, do, do me a favor. <clears throat> but tell me, without you responding to his statements, just tell us, what, just tell us the case that he made. Okay. Because okay. I assume in your follow-up, you're going to talk about your responses. Well, uh, to tell you the truth, I just didn't have the time. And, okay. Well, well, we can allow people to read those pieces, but focus on his case, just okay. so that we know. So his case was, you don't need to go to the temple. It's a bad idea to go to the temple. And Rock is teaching. And so then what he would do, he would respond with, uh, in this case, I think it was a statement by President Hinckley about how important it was to be married in the temple. And then he would have something from the handbook and something from a manual. And so he was overcoming my, uh, my, apostasy, my apostate teachings by showing what the doctrine actually is. So then he next went to a piece called, Are We Paying Too Much Tithing? Again, a provocative title that implies that, hey, maybe we shouldn't be paying so much tithing. So, um, and he combined that with another piece that was called, uh, When Tithing Settlement Goes Horribly Wrong. And, uh, and he responded with these about uh, with by statements from general authorities of how important tithing is and so on and so forth. And then thirdly, let's see what uh, what was the other one? Oh yeah, too bad I don't like beer. Yeah, so so I've got a piece called "Too Bad I Don't Like Beer," and uh, in which I I taught that beer had never been considered uh, one of the uh, spirits that was banned. The beer was the mild barley drink spoken of in 17. But he went off then. He not only quoted some general authorities uh, uh, about the evils of beer, but he went off on this uh, this diatribe of the eagles, evils of alcohol and how addictive alcohol is. And so, so that was his case. So, so, so that, he was, th those are the four articles that he mentioned. Exactly. So, so it was too bad I don't like beer. Are we paying too much tithing? Um, when tithing settlement goes horribly tithing wrong. Settlement goes horribly wrong. Interestingly, he did not touch on the on the piece that uh, uh, Brett Bartell, I think it was Brett, that uh, uh, the guest post about uh, uh, mission. Pro it's called how to calculate what you owe in tithing, because that's an embarrassment. Anybody who goes to that, and that's that's a real eye-opener, and people right. get really indignant when they find that their tithing money is being spent for for the horseback riding lessons and swimming lessons and tutus of right. Uh, right. of mission presidents. Children. Okay, so I think we can basically leave our listeners to read what you wrote in those articles, and uh, I think it's fair to just say that in your mind, he was sort of creating a straw man where he was mischaracterizing in, in many cases, the articles that you wrote and that it wasn't a fair 
characterization of them exactly. as he related it them a, to the it was very unfair okay. and it was it was designed to convince the men present uh that i advocated things that i did not advocate at all when what i about the, bishops? the bishops what about the bishops okay connie uh, connie's turn all right connie give it to us okay he said that he had picked at random bishops in the stake to read these articles and pick out the things essentially that would get rock i mean it, it, he didn't say that but that would that bothered them and that would be considered apostasy so he was going by their statements according to him so kind of a collective wisdom of both his judgment and the judgment of some local bishops. Some local bishops. Okay. 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 That's that's, you know, different people think about revelation in different ways. It sounds like he considers revelation to come through maybe a collaboration with others. You know, there was one other uh, facet, and it was my what he considered my disrespect for the leaders of the church, that uh, that I was not able to sustain the, uh, them as prophet seers and revelators. And I, well, I'll tell you what my answer to that was when that time comes. So, and they're infallible. Yeah, so, so now it comes time for my defense and my witnesses, so Connie went first. And back to Connie. <laughs> I have a pretty severe heart arrhythmia, and so I'm I'm in this room with 17 really kind of hard-nosed guys, and it it was difficult for me. And so at this point, my was getting so bad, my right arm was going numb, and I was just I was kind of becoming more of a, in a weakened state. I was very upset because things were so taken out of context, and. Well, there were just some a lot of things that bothered me. And you could look around the room and you could see some of these men, most of them were looking at us with really hard faces. But there were some who seemed um, open, maybe, even compassionate. And possibly they were compassionate towards me because I was married to this apostate. I have no idea. But, but I justified that um, I left the church in 2007 and I... In, a, in many ways became an anti-Mormon because of blogs, other blogs that I had read, which was very unlike me. And I wanted to take my name off the roll, and I testified that Rock talked me out of doing that. He said, why don't you stay in the church while you're working all of this through and working it out? And he was so loving and kind about this. You know, he didn't judge me for it. And I said, it was Rock's blog that ultimately brought me back to the truth, to the Book of Mormon, to the Restoration, all of the things that I thought most Mormons held dear. And I said, essentially, that if you're going to, at this point, at this point I was getting very weepy, and I said, look, if you're going to judge my husband out of, out of the church handbook, because that kept being quoted. It was the ensign in the church handbook. Rock was quoting scripture, but I didn't hear a scripture or a reference to Christ, not once, in there. And um, even a reference, much less, you know, we were bearing our testimonies and speaking of Christ, and, and it didn't matter to them. And so at this point, I said, if you're going to, go from the church handbook then I'm I'm done here mm. and I was just I was shaking so badly I just I was going to stay there the whole time with rock but I decided you know I needed to get out of there before I had a stroke or something you know so anyway that was me back to rock thanks Connie all right so so our former home teacher was kind enough to wheel her back out she was in her wheelchair uh what a, any testimony of christ was steered back to what about the brethren do you have a testimony of the leaders of the church do you support them do you sustain them no matter how vigorously either of us would testify of jesus christ of the importance of the book of mormon of the importance of joseph smith's role it always came back to what about the modern living prophets? Right. They didn't want to hear 
<laughs> it was almost as if the name of Jesus Christ was anathema. It was poison. Put up a cross. No, we, can't, we, we don't want to hear that. We want to hear what you think about uh, the modern leaders. It was surreal. I will say this. There was lots of love in that room. Connie and I brought it in with us. <laughs> we, we didn't. When we walked in, it wasn't there, and uh, there it was. Uh, Tell them about the picture on the wall. What was the picture on the wall? The picture on the wall was of Jesus Christ washing his disciples' feet, and it it's just they were so. Well, they just they weren't anywhere near that. These people clearly. I felt hate coming from them towards Rock, and they just wanted him out. Well, they I don't... They didn't care to hear about Christ. They didn't care about anything. Right. Okay, okay, Rock, tell us more about the, your defense. Okay, so uh, they wheeled Connie out, and <clears throat> I was I was given 45... Uh, well, actually, Connie had already eaten, or her, her testimony already eaten, cut into some of the time I was given. I had four or five men coming and then and, and also my testimony all within 45 minutes so i started by i showed them this sheaf of papers and i started reading them i, I just sometimes very brief uh, a sentence a line sometimes there were longer stories and uh, i started to get on fire you know because here were people saying they were thanking me because you know there's a lot of confusion in the church and uh and my blog, uh, what I try to do is show people that you can be a Mormon and you don't have to worry about what the corporate church is up to. They're irrelevant. Well, I think that's one of the things that really bothers the men because to them, <clears throat> the CEOs of the company, if you don't respect the CEOs, why would you want to be a member of the church? Well, the reason I want to be a member of the church, I told them, is because Jesus Christ told us that his church is all who repent and come unto him. That's it. We are not required to pay uh, allegiance to anyone else. We're not even required to, to believe in Joseph Smith in order to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. So then uh, uh, before uh, too much time went by, I asked for my first witness to be brought in. And uh, I, I can't recall what order they are, and I, I'm, I'm reluctant to name them because... Uh, well, two of them are on the high councils of uh, their various wards in different parts of uh, California. You mean their stakes? Stakes, yes. Okay. They're high council members, and uh, one of them has sat through twenty of these. And he said, he said, uh, I've. And the interesting thing about this one fella is he's not really a, a a big fan of the blog, but he's a friend of mine through Connie. He went to high school with Connie, and so we've. And he he told them that we've spent about five hours a year. Every once a year, we have dinner together, and he says I spent probably twenty hours between time talking with rock and he's he says i've read several of his articles and he says i can tell you one thing there's nothing there that's toxic so that was a good testimony then an, another high council member came in and he told about how he had be, begun having his doubts and questions and he he uh he lived in a neighboring town and uh he contacted me and we went out for pizza together and we talked for three hours and he said never in any of that time did rock give me any reason to uh to to doubt the church or to uh you know to see the church as the enemy we found the common ground in our in our relationship with christ and with our with, with what we uh what we respect about the uh restoration in the book of mormon and uh, another uh, uh fella came in and he said he had been having some real struggles and uh, and doubts and questions and that by reading my blog he was able to reconcile these things and remain in the church and his wife and he, he and his wife are active they've got three children raising in the church and then a, a doctor who just had to come oh, and once again I'm sure he wouldn't mind his name being used but I'm, I'm not sure so uh, and, and here's the reason why people are reluctant to have their name if associated with me because there is a there is an element of fear created by the church today that if you stand up for somebody they might go after you so anyway this doctor has just come in to uh to work at the uc davis hospital and uh wonderful guy just just love him to death and uh and uh he testified about you know 
essentially the same thing these guys were. So then when they were gone, I read some more of these documents. And then I really lit, lit, into, I lit into the state president for, for being disingenuous. And I told him, you, you misquoted Lorenzo Snow when you said you read Lorenzo Snow's quote that says all men every man woman and child in the church should pay a proper tithe I said there's an ellipsis in there you read that out of the handbook did you notice the ellipsis they left out three important words every man woman and child who has means I said now why do you think that the church handbook left out three little words there's just not space enough for it. I said, because we are being led down a path of, of an understanding of tithing that isn't proper. He had called me, he had accused me of calling um, Jeffrey Holland a liar. And the context was, uh, in, in my blog on tithing, I referred to a link. I, well, he read what I said. I said, if, and if you think that these men aren't above fabricating the truth when it suits their purposes, take a look at this link. That link led to a, a talk by Jeffrey Holland that he gave in conference. And in that talk, he purported to read a pamphlet that James Talmadge had written in the early 1900s. And in that pamphlet, James Talmadge explained that tithing is not to be paid in advance. It's to be paid annually at the end after you know what your, your uh, increase. increase is and, and that that those who don't have, he says, some years you won't have increase. You're not required. You're not obligated to pay tithing. So all these things were in this pamphlet, but Jeffrey Holland was selectively leaving those out and then adding his own opinion in this talk so that when, when you read the talk, you can see the parts that he added that imply that he's still reading the pamphlet. He's depending on, a, and for those who don't know, James Talmadge was an apostle. Orson Pratt taught the same things. And today we have people, and, and, and so part, part of my testimony, I said, we have bishops telling widows that if they don't pay their tithing, they can't get in the temple. I said, this man here is trying to tell you that I'm telling people they can't get in the temple, and I say it's a disgrace that any of you would keep a poor widow out of the temple because she hasn't paid for the privilege. Anyway, I, I, I got to admit I was on fire in a few places, and I was getting some the attention of some men, and I was beginning to think I was getting through. I, I'm convinced I was getting through to some of them. Anyway, long story short, by the, uh, uh, I, I left the sheaf of testimonies, and, and of course, I also mentioned uh, this is kind of a railroad job because I don't have time. You people don't have time to even know what I'm, what I'm actually saying, what my positions really are. You have to make a decision tonight. So anyway, they did that. I, I was taken out and waited in the waiting room with the public relations people. By the way, one of the public relations people seemed to be there because he, he was a younger guy. He was probably there as muscle. So I'm guessing that they expected the media to be there and maybe some kind of riot. So I don't know. You know, I, what do they expect? That they have to have people to, uh, they have to keep the other people out of the building? Why can't they come sit in the foyer? It was nonsense. Anyway. Um, yeah. These people were kissing up, to me especially, like you would not believe. Can I push your wheelchair into the bathroom and getting me water and just all these smiles and all this joy? And I will say the last thing I said when I witnessed about Rock, I said, if you're going to excommunicate my husband, then you're going to have to excommunicate me because I believe the way that he does. And I, I'm going to set up my own excommunication now. I've, it's, it's time. It's time. I'm not going to just go away quietly, even though it's terrifying to me. I believe that the way the way they spoke about rock, the way they took things out of context, it was. And I've always told this. I've always told Rock this. I said they're going to come after you because you're affecting their pocketbook. And ultimately, that really was what this was all about. They threw in the beer thing and, and the temple, but really what it is, people are paying their tithing in a different way since Rock wrote these blogs on their own, making their own decisions, and ultimately that, that's what it's about. It's about the money. 
So I'm done. Anyway, I just wanted to get that in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Connie. <laughs> I, I should back up just a tad. When the, the bishop the bishop interrupted me because my time was finished, and he says, "Okay, now you know it's time for you to go out, and we will stake, deliberate." Stake president, right? Stake, stake president. president. Okay. Thank you very much. Just making sure. <clears throat> so uh, the the men all the men all stood, and I said, "Okay, let's have hugs all around." So I hugged each one of these men. Not all <laughs> of them knew how to react to that, because honestly, John, I don't hold any uh, animosity. These men were being played. You know, most of these men, they didn't know the first thing, and I, I don't, I'm, I don't hold guile, but I, I, I don't respect the state president for what he did, and the way he did it, and it's pretty clear to me, especially based on the fact that he, uh, he had in the past said he wasn't interested, in in my blog or really interested in excommunicating me, and now he has a paper, a stack, a file of papers, uh, to use against me. Yeah, uh, everybody knows that this is a setup. Everybody knows that, that this comes from above, uh, and yes. that, that there's just no room for uh, for someone to tell the truth. I will. I, I I should back up because when I responded to the things he said and I corrected his errors, I said, you know, there was one thing, Doug, that you left out of your response. You never once quoted the Lord. You quoted you quoted the handbook. You quoted manuals. You quoted general authorities who weren't quoting God. But you forgot to you forgot to tell us what God God's response. And if you're going to try to overcome the things I say with doctrine, by the way, the things I spoke were doctrine. I didn't make up my opinions. I was I was laying out what the doctrine of the church is. That's what my blog is all about. And essentially, and I, I've said this before, and most people understand. Our doctrine comes from God. We've got to get away from this idea that anything a leader of the church says is the same as if it become, comes from God, because that's idolatry. Except, that's the, except the doctrine and covenants or whatever says, whether by my voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Okay, John. John, I want you to go, when we're done here, look for the blog piece titled, Not Quite the Same. That's absolutely, that scripture is completely misapplied. It's never intended to be applied to future leaders of the church, uh, especially this church. But I won't go into that. Leave you and, and any of okay. your leaders. That's it's fine. called Not Quite the Same. <clears throat> and by the way, anybody here who's new to this, I would recommend uh, two pieces that I think are probably the most important. One is called Who You Call an Apostate, and the other is My Testimony of the Church. If you want to get a feel for where I stand and what I'm about, those are the two. My Testimony of the Church and Who You Call an Apostate. And then add to that, um, not quite the same. It, uh, completely overcomes these ideas that we're taught in the church. Well, look at how look at how easily... We allow ourselves to be misled by, by one snippet of scripture. This church has taught has taught us all growing up that, that that scripture in Malachi: "Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, even this whole nation." So th the implication is we members need to pay our tithing, otherwise we're robbing God. Malachi, if you read Malachi, you can see clearly he is talking to the priests. He's rebuking the priests because they're robbing God and the whole nation because they they were embezzling the tithing right. funds. Yeah, I think you mentioned this in the last yeah, episode yeah. too. So, so it's like this everywhere. This this scripture you just quoted by my own mouth, by the mouth of my servants, it is the same. Totally, totally. Again, Okay, so li listeners will have to go read those. Yeah. So tell so, us, tell us how it ended. What were the last moments? Okay, so uh, so we waited for a while, and then he called. Uh, how I long? How long did you wait? Oh gosh, what do you think? It yeah, a good half an hour or so. Only a half an hour? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think it was it was preordained. Um, uh, no, my okay. Other, others may, others longer, may have huh? been hours, so that's interesting. Well, did you get a lot more time too? I bet you did. Uh, I got an hour. Is that well? You got an hour to talk, including witnesses. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure Carson and Marisa got the same thing, but I'm not sure. What did the state president say? The, at the beginning? state president said at the beginning, "I will talk for 15 minutes. There will be no interruptions, questions, or answers. You have 45 minutes, and there will be no questions or yeah. answers." So I am. I'm, I was really disappointed at that because I thought, what if these men wanted to ask Rock some questions, but they weren't allowed? Right. Well, you know, the fact of the matter, they were given opportunities to ask the, uh, the witnesses questions, and they just sat there like bumps on a log. 
the I, I was not impressed with I'm not impressed with the quality of people in leadership at any level anymore. In my day when I was younger, we had theologians. Um we had people who were really interested in the gospel. I didn't get that impression okay. from these guys. Well, there, the questions that they asked, they, I'll, they asked each one of my, my witnesses whether they sustain Thomas Monson as prophet, seer, and revelator. Interesting. This is one note, Johnny. That's the only thing they cared about. So it's about, it's about authority, basically. It's about authority. Yes. If you don't sustain the authority, you don't belong here. Out yeah. of the club. Okay. All right, so how... Tell, how did it? So they okay. deliberated. Yeah, just they called me half in. an hour. They called me in, and uh, I go back to my seat. And President, in his quiet, calm voice, tells me uh, the the decision has been excommunication. And by the way, for those who are not familiar with how these procedures work, there's not a vote taken. There's deliberation. There's some discussion. But the other members of the High Council don't vote pro or con. What they do is they are given the opportunity to sustain the president in his decision. It's the president's decision whether or not uh, the person is going to be excommunicated or disfellowshipped. And the other fellows, they, they're given the opportunity to agree with him. And, they, and so I, I came in and I was told it was unanimous. That actually kind of surprised me because I, I could tell I was getting through. The spirit was very strong when I was speaking. And again, I credit, I credit this, the prayers and the, the kind energy of all the people who were, who were focusing their energy on this. This is an important, I told these men, I said, we're at a, an important watershed time in our church. I said, people are leaving and draw. <laughs> and the president, president overcame that with Quentin Cook's talk, which is just, you know, you just have to give that a horse laugh. Quentin Cor Cook's latest conference talk where he said, the church is not losing members, the church is growing. <laughs> so that's, everybody knows that's just, uh, uh, well, most of us know that that's just damage control. It's a, it's a silly thing to say. Um, the church is stagnant. And uh, any growth that is there is mostly, uh, you know, baptisms of children. So, and third world nations. But so, any any other final things about your actual trial? Um, I think uh, I think I was given a few a chance to say a few words, and I did. I rebuked, and and I, I I said to them as I was leaving. So they all stood up as I was leaving, and I said, you know what I. I, I'd suggest you guys do, talking to these 12 or 17, I, I would suggest that you go home and pick five or six of my blog posts at random and get to know. It's too late now to change this, but why don't you, why don't you read those and get an idea of what I really stand for? And I said, who knows? You may repent of your decision. And they just stared at me. <laughs> I meant that kind of in jest, but they stared at me like, you know, how dare you? <laughs> right. So, um, a fun time was had by all. Again, <laughs> this was not, this doesn't change anything. I don't right. know what they intend to call it. I, I, I did point out, I said, I said to the brethren, I said, this won't, this won't cut me off from God. It won't blot out my name. It won't change my relationship with God. It won't affect my testimony. And, of course, again and again, I, I was very adamant about my testimony of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and the core fundamentals of this faith. But I said, the only thing it'll do, and I pointed to Doug Hansen, the only thing it'll do is he'll be able to point and say, well, that guy's uh, got, been excommunicated, so he has no credibility. I said, it's not working anymore. We are living in a time when there are so many people leaving the church, and everybody has somebody in their family who's left the church. It doesn't mean anything. You're not scaring anybody anymore. So, do as you know. Do what you will, but uh, it, it changes nothing. There's two churches. Oh well, I mentioned this. You know, you see this on my blog. I say that we're we're living in a time where where we have two religions in this church running side by side, both vying for for uh, 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 I forgot the words. Anyway, kind of the uh, Church of Christ and the and the corporate church. Yeah, and the corporate church and the corporate church feels like it's winning. Um, but it's not. Um, it, they think that they are in the right. It's, 
if we ever understood what Phariseeism was like in the ancient days, this is it. There's a, there's a sense of certainty that we are in the right and we have more truth than anyone else and anybody who doesn't believe as we are is an inferior. And I say, the church of Jesus Christ belongs to all who repent and come unto Jesus Christ. You don't need these guys unless, and once again, frequently within my testimony, I said, and they asked me, do you sustain President Monson? I said, I've sustained him many times. But I said, recently, President uh, uh, Russell Nelson said something in conference, and he said that when, you, when we sustain the prophet, we are legitimizing his prophetic calling and making that binding upon ourselves. And I said, I don't know about you, but if I don't know that President Monson is a prophet. And the reason I don't know that is because I haven't seen any evidence of it. I'm not going to swear an oath before God and lie. And you you keep, you guys keep asking me if I'm going to lie about something I don't know. Now, I said, the minute President Monson comes up to the stand and says, I have a message from God, and here's the words he spoke, I'm going to perk right up. But until he does that, <laughs> they're irrelevant. They don't matter. They don't count. We don't need that corporate church as an umbrella over us. We can worship individually. The Lord said something very interesting in DNC 1067. In 1067, he defined his church as those who believe and come unto him. In the very next verse, he said, those who define it as in any other way aren't of my church. And these guys are defining the church as headquarters and the leaders and, 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 and the entire structure. He's telling them right there, you don't belong. You're out. You guys are the apostates. Right. Did, did, the, did the disciplinary council feel loving and did it feel just or fair? <laughs> It did not feel loving. It didn't feel just and fair. We did all we could to to bring love into that room, and and it was sincere love. Uh, but they weren't reciprocating. It, there was a deadness to it. And and uh, once again, this is not what I've been <clears throat> a hardness. This is not the sort of thing I've been accustomed to in my younger days. <clears throat> As I mentioned in my other interview, I have been through a council of love, a, a, a court of love. They did exist in the old days. Uh, Richard Craycraft, who was the Dean of Humanities at BYU, and, and a man I greatly admired because he, he, he had written several articles for Dialogue magazine. Uh, he, he was the state president who held forth in, in the court of love. And he said to me, so this was, as I mentioned before, before I met Connie, I... I, I committed a sexual transgression and I turned myself in and I went through the process and he said every man here is fully aware is fully aware that if circumstances presented themselves they could be in the same situation you're in no one here no one here is here to fault you no one here is, is here to condemn you we understand and I felt that. I felt a court of love 36 years ago. I did not feel anything like that today. I was on trial because I was considered somebody who had broken into their homes and rummaged through their silverware. I, I didn't matter. And the sooner they can get rid of me, the better. That's why eight days notice. You're invited if you want to come, but we're going to do this anyway. Don't even bother if you don't want to. And there was no counseling with you in the None. year leading up. None. And I even asked him when he when I came back in and he said, you are being excommunicated for apostasy. I said, would you read the def definition of apostasy, please? And he reads the handbook definition, which isn't the actual definition, but it's the one they go by. And he says it's uh, uh, being disobedient to leaders after, after uh, frequent corrections. And I said, you never corrected me. I said, I met with you once and the bishop once, and both of you said, you're not even familiar enough with my blog to talk about it. And I asked you if there's something in there that you would correct, that you found undoctrinal. I'd change it. I'd make the correction. And you said, I am not really. And he backpedaled on that. He lied. He, he, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little worked up. But the, the man, he had an agenda to follow. He followed it. He did it the way I imagine Saul of Tarsus did in his day, 
when he persecuted the true saints of God, anything to win, anything to get rid of these corporate firing. It was yeah, yeah. Basically, I was called in, called in to a board of directors and told that uh, you know I don't uh, respect the 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 leaders in that company, and so out you go. Um, so it didn't feel fair or just. It was not fair. It was definitely unfair. It was not just. It was insidious. It was an act of perfidy. It was wrong. And God did not smile on that room. And that's why the room was hard. That's why there was no spirit in that room other than the spirit that Connie and I brought to it and my witnesses. You could tell, you could sense a palpable difference when a lover of Christ walked into that room because the spirit was with them, but the spirit had withdrawn from those men. I will testify to that. Right. Okay. Well, um, so what's next? Well, um, I'm going to shut down my blog and begin to obey my priesthood leaders. <laughs> Just, I'm, nothing is going to change. Connie, of course, will probably follow through. She's going to insist on an ex, a court of excommunication. <clears throat> and if they won't give it to her, she'll, uh, she'll write to Salt Lake and complain that they won't, they won't hold her accountable. <laughs> um, I'm going to, of course, appeal this because that's what you have to do. I believe the Lord expects us to take every step to give these men the opportunity to condemn themselves. And that's what they did. By There were men there whose hearts were touched at one time or another, but ultimately they voted. And, you know, Denver called me yesterday morning to give me a few words of encouragement. And he, he told me, look, every one of those men was called by that stake president to his position. So, of course, they believe he's inspired. He called them to high office. So he's not going to make a mistake. So he's not going to, he didn't make a mistake in calling them. He's not going to make a mistake in, uh, in deciding that someone needs to be gone. Right. What am I going to do? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to blog again soon. And uh, uh, I'm probably going to be more vociferous and, and bold and not hold back. Um, if, if it's going to be pointed that this guy isn't a member of the church, so don't listen to him, well, well I don't really have to uh, pull my punches then, do I? Yeah. Okay, so it'll be business as usual, <laughs> or strong, rock, water, and stronger than ever. I'll, and I'll tell you, I still love the Lord. I, 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 I walk with him daily, talk with him daily. I I love the Book of Mormon. I I revere it, and I I am amazed at how prescient it is in foretelling the kinds of people that are going to that are in involved in church leadership today on both the local level and and the uh, top level. I'm just amazed at how prescient that book is. Yeah, and I guess the scriptures do talk about the church potentially coming under condemnation, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the <laughs> it's 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 palpable. Now, here's a, a, an interesting question. Would I recommend anybody else go through this? I don't know. Now, um, prior to this, I recommended everybody. Make, you know, if if they want to kick you out, it's best not to resign. Make them make them take you kicking and screaming. It's, I think, for many people, it would be a very traumatic experience. I don't know what it is about me. I'm hardened. It was very traumatic for Connie. She said she's grieving today. I've seen many people post uh, on Facebook and say, I'm so sorry this is happening. Well, I just want to tell them it's a joyous time to be alive in the Lord. It's a joyous time to be able to, to testify of Christ. And it's a really, really surreal thing to be in a room that as ostensibly calls itself the Church of Jesus Christ, to have these people dismiss the testimonies of Christ, ignore the testimonies of Christ, and try to bring you back to, yeah, but do you idolize the men? That's what they want to know. Do you idolize these men? I've, that's all, I guess all, I, all I've got. All right. <laughs> now, I know I'm quite animated, and I may sound upset. I love it. I love I'm, it. And then, uh, what, you, what you've seen tonight is uh, very much today is very much like uh, what they saw in that room. There were times of quiet um, firm uh, conviction and times when I really laid it on the line and, uh, and uh, uh, 
you know, it's interesting what the Lord said about the church being under condemnation. You know, we don't, uh, after President Benson reminded us in 1984 that that, or 83, that that, that condemnation still holds, it was forgotten. Nobody followed up. Nobody reminded us. Nobody requoted him. But and nobody thinks about what that means. Well, what does condemnation mean? When a house is condemned, it means it's unfit for the owner to live in. We say this is the church of Jesus Christ, that this is his home. But if it's under condemnation, if he says he's condemned this home, he's not living in it. And you can feel that when you go to church. I don't think, you know, I have talked to somebody whose church experience on Sunday is, is very good. He enjoys it. But most, the majority of people tell me that there's nothing there. It's dead. And, and why, why can't we keep converts? You know, we keep converts an average of nine months because they have had this wonderful experience spiritual experience with the missionaries who taught them. In the they, Book of Mormon that they read. In the Book of Mormon. So they have this one-on-one, -on -one and they feel the Spirit. And then they are brought into the church, and the missionaries disappear, and that church experience isn't anything like what they experienced, the, the converting them. So they're gone. So mm -hmm. and, and yet the church continues to keep them on the rolls. And I pointed out to these guys, I said, look, remember, the church counts as an active member Anyone who attends once in a three-month period, and they count those three-month periods around Christmas and Easter. And so I said, the, the church boasts of 15 million members. All they have is four and a half million members who they can say are active, and how many of those are only coming once every three months? I said, we have a problem, and you guys aren't seeing it, and you're going to kick out the one guy that all of these people, I'm showing, the, showing this room, all of these people say, this blog has helped me decide yeah. to stay in. Yeah. Do what you're going to do, you fools. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Connie, give us the last word. Yes. Well, I was, when I was in the room with the witnesses and a, and a fine friend of mine who came to be there for me and also go and witness for Rock, um, this man was so upset and he just kept looking at the ground and shaking his head. And he said, so many people are going to be hurt by this. He said, what, what will people do? Well, Rock's okay. He's going to keep preaching the good word. It's, it's going to go on as usual. Rock will go on as usual. There's no reason to be upset, grieve, or... You know, it's just, we we both love the Lord. I'm very much involved in Rock's blog, and, and I, I, can, I can witness and testify to you of his love of the Lord, and mine too. And it will just business as usual. All right. Uh, okay? I, I, I would just add that nothing Connie just said would was, is to indicate that anyone's testimony hinges on me, because of course it doesn't. But these but are people, some may, well, and no, that's too bad. These are people <laughs> who have told me that, unfortunately, their testimonies in the past hinged on the brethren, and now they're free of that, and they can keep their testimonies of the gospel. There, yeah, there will be people leaving the church uh, now, but they're not going to be leaving their beliefs behind. They're not going. Well, to that's not what he said. I right. just want to say he wasn't well, yeah. worried that people were going to leave the church. He was just very concerned about hey. how people were going to take this news. And so I know you got to totally. yeah. go. So it's no, okay. It's, uh, my family's calling me for dinner. Um, <laughs> Rock, you're a, you're a modern day Abinadi. And uh, <laughs> bless you. He was. You should have seen him. And Connie, it's so wonderful to, to see you at his side and to meet you. And I just want to say bless you both. And uh, I'll invite listeners to come up to mormonstories.org to make their comments. Uh, Rock and Kanye, I hope you guys will be there to respond. Um, but, but thank you both for coming on Mormon Stories and for your courage. We love and support you guys. And, uh, and thanks to all the listeners who, who support Mormon Stories and, and your, your contributions make it possible. So bless you both. Rock, you, you trying to say something? Grab the, grab the microphone because I can't hear you unless you got it on. John, thank you for this opportunity to be heard. Uh, somebody, somebody asked, why would you, why would you want to talk to John DeLynn? He's an apostate. He's, I said, he's the, he's the only guy that asked me. That's why. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and even, even if, even if others had asked, I would 
come to you anytime. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all the listeners and viewers and all you people out there in TV land. All right, love Rock. You. We love all you right. guys. Thanks, right. thanks so much. Thanks, Connie. And thanks, listeners. Take care. We'll talk to you soon.